And we're back again. It's the Horror Guys with episode 167. I'm Brian. And I'm Kevin. And as usual, we've got four horror films and a short film for you. Yep, we're going to talk about them. And I think we kind of liked all of these. Some uh, are better than others. Some are better than others, but yeah. There's know, no real stinkers here. No, no, maybe, you know, super knockout winners, but yeah, you know, they're all, they're all on the upside. They're all decent. Yeah. Yeah. Uh-huh. At least decent. Yeah. Better than a five out of 10. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. <laughs> all right. We're going to watch four films in a short. We're going to start out with Crimson Peak, an unusual ghost story from 2015. I know this one's gotten a lot of hate over the years. There's, there's reasons for that, mm-hmm. but it, we we liked it. Yeah, overall. Yeah. Overall. Yeah. Then we'll look into Exorcismo, a Spanish film about an exorcism from 1975. We'll talk about a fun short, and then look into The Frighteners, a classic horror film that starts out as a comedy and sort of stops being funny about halfway through. Yeah, it gets awful dark. The Cellar, a deadly serious tale about a missing girl and a haunted house. And that's a brand new one. Yeah, and it also has gotten a lot of horror, uh, bad, bad flack lately. Undeserved. Uh, It's got its problems, but overall, I don't regret watching it. No, not at all. All right, now we will start out with... The Crimson Crimson Peak. Peak. Not The Crimson Peak, just Crimson Peak. I keep wanting to type Crimson Peaks because I've seen, you know, Twin Peaks too often. Everything should have an S on the end. No connection there. The Crimson Peak. From 2015, directed by Guillermo del Toro, written by him and Matthew Robbins, stars Mia Wasikowska, Jessica Chastain, and Tom Hiddleston. One hour, 59 minutes. And there's a trailer if you have not seen any of this. So what do we got spoiler-free? Well, we start out the movie with the statement that ghosts aren't real, she says. They are real. Oh, ghosts are real. (laughs) I misread that. You may have heard otherwise, but ghosts are (laughs) real. Yes, that's right. She does. She's doing a voiceover. And so we kind of know how it ends. We're seeing the very, which you don't realize necessarily, but we're seeing the very ending at the beginning of the movie. Yeah, but well, and it is a little more complicated than that when there are multiple ghosts with multiple motives, and it looks good, it moves well, it's interesting how it starts at the ending, and then we see how things get to that point. Most of the time, I don't care for that. I mean, you see in the beginning, for example, you know the character's dead, and then you jump back and then three you, weeks earlier, like American Beauty, you know, where he starts out the voiceover at the beginning, "I'm dead." This, okay. is, this is how it happened. Yeah. <laughs> <You know>? Okay. <laughs> sometimes that's Spoiler. okay. I mean, sometimes <laughs> yeah. it's good to know where this is all going to lead. Yeah, sometimes it really works. But and... this one really doesn't spoil anything other than that ghosts are real, which we kind of figured that going in since it's a ghost story. Yeah, because there's, no mo- there's too much you don't know. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, ghosts are real, says Edith, who is narrating. She talks about her mother's funeral when she was 10 years old. There were no goodbyes. Until the night she came back, she adds. We watch a black, ghostly thing talk to her in her bedroom late at night. And it's not a friendly visit. Credits roll. Fourteen years later, in Buffalo, New York, Edith runs into Dr. Allen, who has returned to town to set up a new practice. We see that Edith is an outsider in the local cliques. She's a writer, but her publisher doesn't like ghost stories. Plus, she's run under the bias of being a female writer, too. Oh, my goodness. Yeah, in the days when, you know, that was looked down upon greatly. Yeah, they all say she should be writing, you know, cook, cook cookbooks and stuff. Mm-hmm. Etiquette she, and things like yeah. that. Yeah, she, she thinks it's because it's, she's a woman, so she wants to type her story to disguise her feminine handwriting. This is before typewriters were a big thing, I guess. Yeah, very, very much so. Uh, she writes like a girl. I mean, there, there are typewriters, but you know, big yeah, and, big and clunky machines. Yeah. Thomas Sharp arrives to talk to her father, Carter Cushing, about investing in his digging machine invention. He looks at her story and likes it, which impresses Edith. He likes ghost stories, and she suddenly likes Thomas. And the fact that he looks like Tom Hiddleston has nothing to do with it. Yeah, what's not to like there? Yeah. Carter refuses to give him money because he's not a working class man. Dr. Allen is very much into Edith, but she just likes him as a trusted friend. Not long after, Edith sees the woman in black again. It tells her to beware of Crimson Peak. Whatever that is, she's never heard of it. Thomas Sharp arrives downstairs to talk, and he invites her to the party that she had declined to attend with Alan. 
Edith meets Lucille, Thomas's sister. Thomas dances a waltz with Edith, a waltz with Edith, which shows up everyone else in the place, annoying them all, especially Dr. Allen. She's like, no, I can't dance. I don't dance. And then, and then dances with him. <laughs> then she dances with him, and everybody stops because they are so fantastic at dancing. Mm-hmm. You know, I, know, I don't dance. I, don't I have really dance, rarely no. ever tried. Mm-hmm. If I were to go down on the ballroom floor, I doubt everyone would stop to watch, <laughs> unless they were, like, <laughs> laughing. <laughs> Well, and I think the message was that he was so incredibly good as a dancer that all she had to do was, you know, follow along and keep up. Yeah, because following is that easy. Yeah, in the movies it is. (laughs) (laughs) Everybody can be a master ballroom dancer on the first attempt. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. Yep. (laughs) Well, Edith's father doesn't approve either, and he orders Mr. Holly to investigate them. Mr. Holly is a sort of a really sleazy detective. A P.I., Pinkerton kind of uh, I think he is yeah. specifically a Pinkerton, yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. Alan, trying to impress Edith, demonstrates spirit photography, which allows a camera to photograph ghosts. Lucille creeps out Edith with her apparent obsession with death. This is the 1800s goth lady. Yep. Carter confronts Lucille and Thomas about their poverty, and Carter thinks Thomas is just a gold digger. He pays them to leave and breaks it off with Edith. Thomas is mean to Edith at Carter's command because he does as he's told. I give you fifty thousand dollars to break off your marriage with my daughter. And and get he's out like, of town. Okay. Yeah. The next morning, Carter is murdered. We don't see the non-ghostly killer, but it could be Thomas. Yeah, the way they were hiding it though made it seem like they were trying to give us a, you know. Make it a mystery. Some, some doubt, yeah. It wasn't clearly Thomas. Thomas is the and obvious there a, suspect. there was a reason. You know, otherwise they would have just had Thomas doing it. Yeah. Which immediately made me suspect, oh, that's not that's Thomas. not Thomas. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, Thomas then sends a letter to Edith explaining what happened last night, and either Edith runs to their hotel, but they're already checked out. She soon runs into Thomas, who still hasn't left town yet, and they immediately make up. The police come, and they think Carter's death may have been an accident. He slipped in the bathroom. And if you see what happened to him, they, they are in no way anybody's going to think that was an accident. No. No. The, the force that his head would impacted the sink. <laughs> Sixteen times or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Thomas is right there for Edith, which she <clears throat> appreciates. Well, and her doctor friend does kind of try to speak up and say, you know, that doesn't look like an accident. And Oh, hush. But, it's, yeah. it's, it's an accident. Yeah, we're going to go away you know, now. Hush, hush, hush him. You know, go away. Yeah. We know what we're talking about. Yeah. Well, things go quickly from there, and he takes his new wife home to Allerdale Hall, a big old place that's falling apart. There's a giant hole in the roof, and the wood is rotting. The red clay in the area has gotten into everything. The wind howls. The water runs red. And the whole place is just a ghost dream house. Edith gets several glimpses of something dark wandering the house. Thomas shows her his workshop, and he's a bit of a tinkerer and inventor. Every time Edith and Thomas start to get close, Lucille interrupts with tea or something stupid. And the the red clay, the crimson clay, it, that's what he came to her dad uh, looking to invest in. It's a special kind of clay. It's got special properties, and is, it's only found in that area. There's tons of it, but he needs a way to practical way to mine it. Yeah, the digging and, machine is kind of like a big just dredge kind, kind of, of thing dredge, with many, yeah. many little buckets. Mm-hmm. It looks like it ought to work. Yeah. Well, a ghost leads Edith to some old recordings. She sees it clearly this time and is a nasty old dead-looking thing. When Thomas refers to the whole area as Crimson Peak, which Edith clearly remembers from her previous visit from the ghost. Meanwhile, Dr. Allen is still questioning how things went with Carter's death and Thomas's strange actions. Mr. Holly gives him additional information. Thomas was already married before he came to town. Oh, my. Uh Uh-oh. The ghosts start warning Edith to get out of the house. Thomas and Lucille try to dissuade her from leaving. How would she know about Mother? asks Lucille. Thomas and Edith get trapped in a motel in town during a snowstorm, and they finally have sex for the first time. While they're in town, Edith gets a letter addressed to Enola, Thomas's other wife. Oopsie. She then learns about two more wives. How many has he had? Yeah, there's some stuff locked up that she finds. Could they have wound up in that bottomless pit of thick red mud in the basement? All signs point to yes. Mm -hmm. 
Edith just won't drink the damn tea that Lucille keeps trying to force, to force on her. How infuriating. Edith finally listens to the recordings and learns that Thomas has been burning through the rich wives. They've been drinking poisoned tea. She tries to leave, but the snowstorm outside is just too much. Thomas seems to be changing his mind. He warns Edith not to drink the tea. Edith talks to the ghost. She wants to know what they want. Are they trying to kill her, or are they trying to help her? Edith catches Thomas making out with his sister. <clears throat> Just as best. We didn't see that coming all along, did we? Mm. A little too close. Yes, they're, they're very close siblings. Lucille throws Edith from the third floor as someone bangs on the front door. It's Alan who then patches up Edith. Lucille demands that Thomas kill Alan before he can steal away Edith. And he has evidence that Lucille, Lucille killed her own mother when she was 14. Lucille stabs Alan on the way out. She then makes Thomas finish him off, but he may have fudged the job on purpose. Thomas tells Alan to get Edith out through the mine shaft. Yeah, and that was actually kind of clever how he did it. Um, uh, Lucille couldn't hear, but they were at the door, and, and Thomas kind of whispered, you know, you're a doctor, tell me where to do it. Yeah. You know, to stab him in a non-vital area that looked good, but wouldn't kill him. You, know. you do it hard enough, most places are fatal. Oh, eventually, <laughs> yeah. With that kind of, a, that that forceful of a stabbing, you're still going to bleed, but it wasn't, you know, a super, super bad area. Yeah. Anyway, it was a clever little moment. Lucille admits to killing Carter, so then Edith stabs her with her fancy pen. When Thomas tries to talk Edith into just leaving the rotted old house... She stabs him in the face, and he dies fairly quickly. Well, that escalated quickly. Yeah, it did. As is always the case with a good haunted house film, Edith and Lucille get into a knife fight. They migrate from one room to the next and end up in the basement next to the mud well, where Alan still waits. Lucille upgrades to a huge meat cleaver, and they go outside to chase each other around Thomas's digging machine prototype. Finally, Thomas's ghost distracts Lucille enough that Edith gets the upper hand. Boom. Yep, there you go. And then she says, ghosts are real. Yeah, and that's where yeah, it they end, are. That, that was the, end, the beginning of the movie again. I don't care how ornate or beautiful that house once was. That place is simply <laughs> uninhabitable. That's insane. <laughs> There's mold everywhere, leaves and snow falling through a huge hole in the roof in the living room. And I don't mean a little hole either. It's like 20 feet wide. Mm -hmm. And water damage everywhere. Even without ghosts, this place is a death trap. Visually, it's a very pretty movie with lots of oversaturated, high-contrast colors, but it still manages to be a dark-toned horror film. The costumes and acting are good, the CGI monsters don't hold up terribly well, and this film's only a few years old. The story is a little on the generic side. It is a haunted house tale, but it doesn't do much beyond what's expected of it. Other than cryptic and ominous warnings, the ghosts don't really do anything. All the evil here comes from the messed up siblings. Still, it looks good. It's not draggy. It's not boring. Overall, I do like it. But don't come here looking up for a straight up monster movie. I Those can't, ghosts I can't don't feel kill anybody. No, no, not no. They either help or warn or you know. Which in reality, you know, ghosts are these. You know, these fluffy light things that you see. And intangible. Intangible. They generally don't hurt people. But sometimes they do. <laughs> and that's when you call in the exorcist. Ex yeah, exorcismo from 1975. And exorcismo is just the Spanish word for exorcism. You can find it under both names. Sometimes it's just exorcism. Sometimes it's exorcismo. It's directed by Juan Bosch, written by him, and Jody Gigo and Paul Nashi. Stars Paul Nashi, Maria Porsche, and Mar Maria Costi, hour and 30 minutes. And we haven't talked much about Paul Nashi here. He did a lot of stuff. He did a lot of stuff. He was the werewolf more often than Lon Chaney Jr. <laughs> uh huh. He yeah. did 13 werewolf movies. But because and he's, many, many other kinds. But because it's, uh, you know, Spaniard and Spanish films, not, yeah. not, not so well known in the U.S. Yeah, some of them are dubbed, most of them are not. So he's not real popular over here, but boy, he did he a lot of things. Look Europe. him up on IMDb sometime. Yeah. Well, spoiler-free, this one was a slow burn, but maybe a little too slow. 
things pick up at the end, but overall there's not much here that improved on The Exorcist that came out two years before. It's fine, and certainly watchable. If you're looking for a different Exorcist movie, this is the same thing, only different. Yeah. So, what happens, spoiler boy? Stuff happens happens in Spanish. More than that. You want more details than that. Okay. (laughs) Well, we begin at a black mass on Uh, the beach. Do you remember, before we get into this, do you remember, was this one dubbed or subtitled? This was subtitled. You sure? Pretty sure. Okay. Yeah, the version we saw. Oh, yeah, it was. Yeah, Yeah, it was. Some Uh of the words were just weird sometimes. The subtitles were weird, yeah. Didn't always match. That didn't make sense, but we got the guest. Yeah. (laughs) Well, hippies all pass around the goblet and they all drink. And if they weren't high before, they were after that. The woman in charge puts the goblet back on the altar and cuts herself, bleeding into the goblet. Well, the next morning, Layla and Richard, one of the couples we saw last night, are in an auto accident. She tries to twist his head around backwards, but she passes out first. Later at the hospital, the doctor says, ah, she'll be fine. Her friends tell the doctor that Layla is acting strange. Layla's brother, John, blames Richard for the changes in his sister. Layla has changed. She's randomly mean and violent now. John goes to see Father Adrian Dunning, oh, Adrian Dunning, for help, and he tells the priest the whole story. We are taking drugs and meeting in heretic circles. Ooh. Ooh. This is bad, right? Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. So the priest is, you know, on board with, you know, everybody knows what what they're doing on the beach. Well, Father Dunning goes to see Patricia, Layla's mother. And she dismisses it just that John is jealous and bitter. He's not being objective about Layla. Deborah, Layla's sister, is there as well. Layla is pretty rude to the priest, but he just laughs it off. Meanwhile, John and Sander the maid are making out in the greenhouse. Hmm. Hmm. Getting it on with the help. When Dunning goes into the greenhouse, John warns him about some dangerous plants. Dunning doesn't see there's a problem with this whole thing, choosing to believe Patricia, the mother. Everybody goes on and on about how bad John is. He's a bad person. He's mean. He's, you know, jealous. He's bad. And we don't see any of that. We don't see any of that. Yeah. He's concerned about his sister. He doesn't seem like a bad guy to us. No, no, they didn't portray that very well. Uh, Deborah goes out to the pool house to change for a swim and finds John with his head twisted around backwards. Oops. Oops. Everyone attends the funeral, including Richard and the police inspector. The next morning, Layla attacks Sandra, the maid, for no reason. We see that the chauffeur, Udo, has naked pictures of Layla, and Sandra finds the photos later. He's a pervy, pervy kind of... Little bit. Pervy kind of servant. Deborah goes to see Father Dunning again, and this time she wants his help. Now he wants to talk to Richard. He goes over there and finds many creepy masks and decorations. Clearly, Richard is into some weird stuff. He actually had some really cool decor. I liked some of the stuff on his walls. And then Dunning finds Richard in bed with his turn, with his, his head turned around, just like John's. We're seeing a pattern here. Well, Patricia talks to a Dr. Lawton, and Dunning goes to see Layla. At Layla's birthday party, Dunning talks to Luton. Oh, I mispronounced that, Dr. Luton. Layla has a sudden hateful outburst and verbally attacks everyone in the room before storming out. And they're all like, what the, what was that about? (laughs) Random tantrums. Yeah. So she's not acting normal. Deborah thinks Layla should be put into a sanatorium, but Patricia, the mom, is still in denial. Their father died in a sanatorium, and it's possible it runs in the family. Nothing to worry about. (laughs) Sanatoriums sure are common in these old movies. Yeah, they are. Yeah. The police inspector tells Dunning all about demons and Satanists. He thinks the murderers, uh, the murders were ritualistic. Dr. Luton cannot explain Layla's case. None of the doctors can. And Deborah thinks her sister is possessed. Well, Layla goes missing. And Deborah and Dunning go to find her. Deborah tells him that Layla has been going to black masses and other things. So they head over to the abandoned castle where a ritual slash party is going on right now. And Layla is right there at the center of everything. Udo is there too. He attacks Dunning. And suddenly every cop in town rushes in to break up the party and arrest Udo. They take Layla home and Dr. Luton does a serious exam of her mental condition. 
Everyone thinks Udo did it. Udo killed John and Richard. The doctor reports there are no drugs in Layla's system. Luton hates to admit it, but it might be possession. He can't explain it otherwise. So, you know, what else going to be? <laughs> <laughs> no, that's always a, the, the go-to excuse. Yeah. Dunning explains that he did ins- assist in an exorcism a few years ago, and he describes the case. Dunning doesn't really believe it. He thought it was drugs at the time, and he suspects that Layla's situation is the same. Udo confesses to the murders and then jumps out the window. So, case called, case closed. Easy peasy. Yeah. Back in the house, someone kills Sandra. Okay. That like wasn't case, Udo. Case not closed. <laughs> yeah. Layla calls upon her master and has an orgasm alone in the room. What? Yeah. <laughs> Cuts and wounds start to appear all over her body. She walks into her mother's room looking a little bit like Linda Linda Blair from The Exorcist. What a coincidence. Mm -hmm. She speaks in her dead father's voice. The servants rush in and stop Layla from killing Patricia. And the family and even the doctor all insist now that Dunning do an exorcism. He looks in on Layla and she's a mess, so he agrees to do the ritual. Dunning hears howling out, uh, downstairs. Bork the dog has found Sandra's body. And, you know, you can't blame that one on Udo. Well, it was Layla. Yeah. Father Dunning starts to have hallucinations and visions. He and the demon have words, lots of words. Stuff <laughs> flies around the room. The bed levitates. Lila writhes, twists, and squirms in bed. There's no pea soup vomit, though. Uh, Dunning reads from the book and splashes her with holy water. The two of them roll down the steps, and Layla dies. Bork, the dog, however, seems to have acquired the demon. The the dog, demon dog, attacks Dunning until the priest stabs the dog with a fireplace poker. Bork the dog. Bork the dog. I want a dog Possessed by a demon. Yeah. (laughs) Well, this was released two years after The Exorcist was a big hit. It's not the same story at all. But there are uh, very obvious similarities, especially at the end. Layla's demon makeup was really good, and her contact lenses were especially interesting here. Other than that, there wasn't much in the way of makeup or special effects. She looked like Linda Blairish in The Exorcist, and beyond that, there wasn't much else going on. Yeah, not much. It was pretty slow. It started out well, but the priest took a little too much convincing in this one before he got to the good stuff. The characters and actors are all fine here, but it's nothing we haven't seen many times in many ways before. Yep, it was a decent Exorcist film. Yeah, it was all right. If you want more Exorcist without being the Exorcist, this is the Exorcist this for you. This is the one to watch. <laughs> all right. <laughs> so then we got a short film called Stuck from this year, just released a week or two ago. And this was a really good one. Written and directed by David Michelson, stars Nicola Lambeau, Dave Johnson, and Tara Danino. 14 minutes, so this is a somewhat longer short. Worth it. And there is a link in the show notes to just go and watch it. It's not a not something you have to go look for. It's on YouTube. What happens? Well, a woman sits in her car and notices a strange man sitting in another car who waves to her. Why is he in this lot? It's a private lot. He says he's waiting for his daughter, but she knows better. It's a gymnastics school for teenage girls, and it's a different group of students each day. So, busted. And she saw him here yesterday. Well, the man acts creepy and then drives away, but we see that he didn't really leave. The car is just parked around the corner. Credits roll. One of the girls spots the man outside, but when she looks, she only sees the car. The police aren't helpful. So she searches the building for him, can't find him. Well, where did he go? Well, she is very paranoid about it, but we soon find out that she isn't wrong. And what can she do about it? And there comes the fun. Uh (laughs) (laughs) Uh-huh. Well, as one of the students says, dang. Dang. (laughs) I noticed the music on this one during the credits. It's very good. It's well filmed and takes a few minutes before you know where it's headed, but it is good really 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 good good. yeah it's one of the one of the better ones yeah worth checking out for sure and also one that you had not seen this before had you i had not i'd missed this one somehow the frighteners from 1996 directed by peter Peter jackson Jackson. yeah the uh 
Lord of the Rings, The Hobbit Guy. Hobbit Guy. Yeah. Dead Alive and Brain Dead. So many things. Many good movies. Yes. And written by Fran, Wal- Fran Walsh and Peter Jackson stars Michael J. Fox, Jeffrey Combs, and Jake Busey. The cast like that, it's hard to go wrong. Oh, yeah. It's a longer one at one hour and 50 minutes. And what happens spoiler free? Well, this one has a really a lot of dark humor in it. And it starts out pretty frivolous, gets darker as it goes along. And there's great performances from D. Wallace and Jeffrey Combs that really stand out. Along the rest of the cast does a really good job. The effects are cool, still hold up pretty well. And this one is worth seeing for sure, if you haven't already. I'd like to know what the backstory was with this one. Did it start out as a comedy and they put all these horror people in it? Or was it a horror film that they decided to lighten up with Michael J. Fox? I was known sure. for comedy. Could have gone either way. I, I, yeah, I, it's... Usually when you get... It's a strange kind of movie. Horror and comedy mixed together, they usually don't go too well together. But this one kind of works. I thought it worked really well. Actually, I think the comedy is the weakest part here. It was a pretty good (laughs) horror film for the most part, especially toward the end. Well, some of the comedy was just a little bit too silly. Yeah. Like his driving, for instance. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. All right, well, well, here's what happens. The camera zooms through an old house as we see bad things happening. A woman screams as the walls themselves grab at her. An old woman shoots at the ghost and credits roll. We then hear a reporter reading an article he's written discussing a long series of sudden heart failure deaths. Dozens of people have abruptly died in town. Could the Grim Reaper be stalking them? The shadow of death? What's the angle? The boss tells him to quit referencing death as a person. Because, you know, death's not a person. Yeah, keep it more factual. Well, there's a funeral, one of these victims. Frank Bannister, a psychic investigator, hands out business cards at the funeral. Of course, you know, if you're a psychic investigator, that's going to be the advertising spot, isn't it? Sure. He wrecks his car into Ray's fence because he's the worst driver ever. Across town, Lucy makes a house call to an old mental institution, which is now a house, and old lady Bradley lets her in. She's the old woman we saw earlier, And the injured younger woman is Patricia, who never leaves the house. Lucy is a doctor, and she notices the bruises all over Patricia and suspects abuse. She wants Patricia to come to the hospital, but they both say no. Later at home, we see that Lucy is married to Ray. John Charles Bartlett was a mass shooter who was captured. Patricia was his girlfriend and was also implicated in the murders. He was sentenced to death and executed. She wound up in the institution. Yeah, but they decided she wasn't really part of it. Ray and Lucy talk about their day, and suddenly the house just goes crazy with stuff flying around. Lucy immediately calls Frank, since he's an expert. He's got a squirt gun full of holy water, and he's not afraid to use it. Turns out he's really just a big fraud, and Ray knows it, but Lucy is all in on his nonsense. As he leaves, Frank sees the number 37 glowing on Frank's head. That's new for him. No, on, on Ray's head. On Ray's head, yeah. yes, yes, it was yeah. Ray's Frank, head. Frank is Michael J. Fox, yeah. As Frank gets home, several ghosts get out of the trunk. He sees them and talks to them, and they're friends of his. They help him fool the rubes. They haunt a place, and then Frank comes in and chases them away. Stuart and Cyrus are the ghosts, and they're also kind of comic relief characters. There is also an old gunslinger, the Judge, and his ghost dog. They've all got their problems. Frank's about to lose his house, and he needs money fast, so he tells them to pump up the scare factor. See, if your friends are ghosts, you just send them to somebody's house, and have them do haunty things, and you go get and called to fix the problem. And, yeah, problem solved. That'll be, you know, here's your bill. I am the problem, <laughs> but I'm also the solution. <laughs> they don't know that. Cyrus and Stuart go to a big old house with wealthy people and do their ghost thing. Of course, Frank is called to help, so he goes over to exercise the house. The judge says the town is in trouble. Death is amongst us. When Frank gets there, the owner shows him a newspaper article about him being a con man. Oops. He doesn't get paid. We then get a quick Peter Jackson cameo as Frank walks through town and and runs into Ray, who is now a ghost. Ray is a little hazy about what happened to him, but Ray wants to go to his own funeral, so they make a quick trip to the cemetery, which is full of ghosts, including a really annoying drill sergeant who beats up Frank and yells a lot. And that's the... Mm-hmm. 
the drill sergeant. The sheriff talks to Fran- Frank about the mysterious deaths. It doesn't seem quite natural, but the experts can't explain it. Lucy is at Ray's funeral, of course, and she still believes. She goes to dinner with Frank that evening, acting as a mediator between her and Ray. He explains that he gained his abilities after a traffic accident. While there, he sees a man with 38 on his forehead in the restroom. He also sees a dark, cloudy shape in one of the stalls. He watches as the mysterious figure kills the man by plunging a ghostly hand into his chest. Another death from a sudden heart attack. Frank follows the creature in his car, while Lucy tells the sheriff about her dinner with Frank and the ghost. Milton comes to the police station. He's a special agent from the FBI, and also a psychic and paranormal expert. And that's Jeffrey Combs, and He's boy, really is weird. he awesome in this. Yeah, yeah. so weird. <laughs> he says Frank is a suspect now. He's very strange, and goes into excruciating detail about how Frank had a traffic accident that killed his wife years ago. Milton says the traffic accident was intentional, and at the time his wife had number 13 on her forehead. The judge says that the creature was the sole collector, and he tells Frank and the other ghosts about it. Frank finds victim number 40, and the judge fights the creature off. Frank is arrested, but escapes with the help of the ghosts. The soul catcher kills the judge, and Frank kidnaps the next victim, the editor of the newspaper, Magda. The soul catcher does his job, and she dies in the same place Frank's wife did many years ago. He then goes to the police station to turn himself in. Milton and Frank talk about the 28 dead people in town. Milton thinks Frank is responsible, but the sheriff disagrees. Frank explains what he's seen and what he can do, but Milton thinks he's just a psychopath. Lucy goes back to the mental hospital, and Ray, who is still following, sees what an evil house it is. Lucy goes in and looks for Patricia, and the two have a long talk. She had nothing to do with the murders way back when, but her mother has been keeping her prisoner in this old house. As she tries to sneak back outside, the house attacks Ray. When she comes to visit Frank in jail, we see that she has the number 41 on her forehead. Whoops. The soul catcher kills Stuart, but Cyrus fights him off long enough for Frank to escape. Frank decides he needs an out-of-body experience to see what's happening on the other side, so Lucy locks him in the meat freezer until he freezes to death, basically. Basically. Milton finds him and wants to let Frank die, so he arrests Lucy. Meanwhile, Frank's soul climbs out of his body and becomes a ghost. Frank fights with the soul catcher as Milton and Lucy go to the cemetery, where Milton rambles and rambles and rambles about how he spent six months as Charles Manson's sex slave. What? Yeah. (laughs) And a myriad of other horrible cults and groups he spent time with. That's quite a monologue that he has there. Oh, yeah. And he's got tattoos to show, you know, uh, (laughs) all the weird things that he did. (laughs) Frank steals Milton's car and goes after Lucy again. Frank steals the drill sergeant's machine guns to fight the creature. Frank recognizes the creature as Johnny Bartlett, who is trying to increase his kill count even after death. Frank's ghost tries to fight Bartlett, but before he can win, Lucy revives him back in the meat locker. He tells her about Bartlett, so Lucy rushes over to Patricia's house to warn her. When Patricia hears about Johnny, she reverts back to her former murderous self. She really was involved in the old murders. Yep, just as bad as he was. Johnny tells Patricia to finish off Lucy, and Lucy finds old lady Bradley dead, and then has to fight against Patricia. Frank arrives and fights with the ghosts of the house as Lucy runs from Patricia. They find Johnny's ashes, and Frank says that they need to get them to a church. As they run around the old hospital, Milton arrives on the scene, and Frank gets flashback of Johnny and Patricia's murder spree many years ago. There's a lot going on here. There is, yeah. Milton grabs Lucy, and the two of them fight. Frank makes it to the the chapel of the hospital, but Milton ends up with the ashes and dumps them out, which is really bad. No way to stop him now. Milton shoots Frank, and Patricia kills Milton, turning him into a ghost. Which was an awesome special effect. (laughs) You remember that? They shoot him in the head. He shoots him in the head with a shotgun. His head, 
and there's just a ghost head still there. Oh, yeah. His body is there with the ghost head, and then the body collapses, and he's a ghost. It was a really cool effect. <laughs> yeah, it was. Johnny follows and gets her back, except the two of them go somewhere different and much less pleasant. They didn't go into the light. Stuart and Cyrus welcome Frank to heaven, where he reconnects with his wife. However, it's not his time to die yet, so they send him back. Apparently everybody here can die except Frank. Mm -hmm. Frank wakes up in Lucy's arms, and sometimes later, we find out that Lucy can now see dead people too. All right. Yeah. Well, that whole stretchy face through the wall gimmick was probably new when this came out, as it's very heavily used here, even in the movie posters. You know, you got like a cloth wall and somebody sticks their face through and it makes it look like the wall is stretching out. Mm -hmm. It's a fun effect, though. It still holds up pretty well. But there's a lot of that gimmick here. Yeah, and they did a combination of CGI and practical effect. Yes. Which yes. I think I think the practical effect aspect of it helps it hold up. Yeah, the, the uh, asylum room house where the floor and the ceilings and the walls, that was all CGI, and that's probably the weakest part. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, it's really hard for me not to make a joke about how dry Frank drives like a guy with Parkinson's disease. Oof. But that would probably be in poor taste, so I won't. <laughs> But there's no explanation for his incredibly awful driving. It's there's it's, no way somebody that drove that badly awful. would be allowed to drive a car. Yeah, it's it's just it's silly. I mean, it, the Three Stooges yeah. can drive better than this guy. <laughs> if you removed all the comic elements from this film, it would still stand up really well as a serious horror film. Still, if that happens, we would have missed out on one of Jeffrey Combs's best roles. Michael J. Fox pretty much plays the same character he always plays just this time with psychic abilities. The other actors do fine, with Dee Wallace in a rare appearance as a villain for once. She's usually the scream queen who has bad things happen to her. Mm -hmm. Not this time. Not this time. She makes them happen. The comedy more or less vanishes about 45 minutes before the end, but that just makes the setup of the horror story more interesting. It's a little different, but absolutely worth watching. So what's your favorite room of the house? Oh, the cellar, definitely. Oh, absolutely, yeah. That's where all the creepiness happens. Yep, it sure does in this movie. Anyway. <laughs> the Cellar from 2022. It's out now. Um, this was Shudder, wasn't it? I believe it was, yeah. yeah. 2022, is an, it's a new one. It's, uh, yeah. Written and directed by Brendan Muldowney. Stars Alicia Cuth Cuthbert. Ewan? Ewan? Ewan, I think. Ewan Mackin? I think. Dylan Fitzmaurice Brady, hour and 34 minutes. And again, this one's on Shudder. This movie, spoiler free, is when bad things happen to beautiful homes and happy families. It's creepy, well acted, and has good effects. It builds nicely, gradually filling in what's going on, and all in all, a thumbs up. But I will add that it does have a few problems that we'll get into later. Yeah, yeah a few problems, but yeah. So, so spoiler wise, so what gonna, happens? So we're going to spoil it, and you are warned because this is a brand new one, and chances are you haven't seen it, and you should if you haven't already. So, spoiler horn. You kind of get the whole story out of the trailer in this one. You know what happens. You just Wait. don't know how it resolves. Yeah, yeah. Well, Kira and her family are moving into a huge old home. Daughter, daughter Ellie says it's gross and creepy. Ellie acts like a jerk because that's what moody teenagers do in the movies. It looks like a perfectly nice house to me. Oh, I thought so. Yeah. Well, they all go down into the filthy cellar and Ellie gets locked in by accident. She hears something down there and panics. And by the time they are able to use the key and get the door open, she's screaming and banging, and she does not want to stay in this old dump. She's one of those teenagers who hates literally everything. And has no problem showing it. Mm-hmm, yeah. Well, par parents Kira and Brian have a work meeting that night, which is weird. They keep having these meetings at night. Like, they don't work during the day. Well, they work during the day, too, but... You know, they this, have to go. They company. drive into the city and go into this high-rise building and have a meeting with at clients night. at night. Yeah. That is strange. Yeah, yeah. Well, anyway, so they leave Ellie and Stevie alone in the big old house for the first night. Uh, her boyfriend calls and she talks about going to live with him. Stephen finds an old cow skull in his playroom. Stephen says his friend told him that the house was owned by a witch who made a pact with the devil. L.A. plays a record that seems to be a man just reciting math. Well, the power goes out. L.A. calls Kira, who tells her to go into the basement and check the breaker. She goes down there carrying a candle. She's obviously terrified, but goes down anyway. And she's counting out the steps with Mom. 
and there's more steps than there should be. She just keeps going and going. Well, they go home, rush downstairs, and Ellie is nowhere to be found. Well, they call the police, but Ellie has run off before, so the police just think, yeah, she'll turn up in a friend's house in a few days, nothing to worry about. There is a search party in the woods the next morning, but still nothing. They put up missing persons signs in the area. Kira doesn't think she ran away. Something happened in the cellar. She searches the cellar and looks at it with an, a UV light. She finds math symbols inscribed into the floor and walls, and many skeletal faces painted on there as well. The police check it out, say that the skulls are just painted on the walls, and they're old and nothing to worry about. Kara notices that there are strange symbols above each of the doors in the house. The letters are Hebrew and spell out Leviathan. So she looks up Leviathan, sees pictures of a big dragon-like sea monster thing. She plays the math record, and at the same time, little Stevie starts reciting the numbers as well, and he walks into a secret door. She stops when she hears him counting numbers. Well, she goes into the basement. Door gets stuck for her as well. They really need to get that thing fixed. <laughs> they do. I mean, there's many, yeah. It's not just tight. It locks. Yeah, by that point. Or put you a know, key on the other side or just block the door open or change the lock or change or the door. Take, or take the mechanism out completely. There's a hundred ways to solve this problem and, and they don't do it. And they don't do it. Just keeps happening. Yeah. Well, she hear, hears something growling down in the basement as Stevie fights to get the door open from the other side. The ominous mu music intensifies until Brian comes and opens the door and everyone's fine. She insists that she heard something, but Brian thinks she's starting to go crazy. Kira tells him that the family who used to live there all disappeared too, so something's not right. Kira goes to see a math professor to show him the formula from the cellar floor. It seems to represent something to do with multiple dimensions, and he also explains that old man Featherston, who used to own that house, was also a math professor. Featherston and the rest of the family did vanish, but his daughter survived. Well, Kira does more research, starts telling this to Brian, who is more and more convinced that she's obsessed and full of nonsense. Well, he goes downstairs, just going to break up the inscriptions. He can't do it. And then the record player starts on its own, and then Stevie sees something appear in the secret room that looks like the rotted cor corpse of Ellie, her sister, his sister. But it vanishes, and they find Ellie's phone in there, upstairs. Well, Brian, Brian starts to be a believer after that. Kira tracks down the last Featherson woman in the nursing home. She tells Kira that Leviathan is one of the seven princes of hell. Her father brought it into the world with his mathematics. It's not just the cellar, it's the whole house, you know, she I've says. always said math is hell. And here we have a, a tangible proof. Yeah. Tangible example of Mathematical it. proof mm -hmm. that math is hell. Yeah. So basically what he did was he set the whole house up as a, as a mathematical um, portal that opens the gateway to hell. Yikes. Cool. Yeah. Well, Brian, meanwhile, has been doing his own research, tells Kiera that the symbols indicate that Baphomet, a demon, is involved. The whole house has been designed around his influence, all the doorways and... Uh, yeah, mathematical symbols all over the place. They play the record again on purpose, and that seems to be the trigger that activates it. Stevie sees Baphomet in the basement, and all hell breaks loose in the house. Well, they find Stevie, but she's clearly not herself, and neither is Brian. They both start counting down to zero, and then, it's here. Something wants through the cellar door. Kara hides and watches as something with horns and goat legs starts clomping around the house. And then she sees the rest of it, runs into the basement to rescue Ellie. The stairs now go way, way down, and there are tunnels. Eventually, she enters hell, or cell, hell itself, maybe just the outskirts, and it's made up of vast numbers of gray, dirty people shuffling in the same direction, counting. Kara far too easily finds Ellie. Well, she had a tattoo on her ankle. Hell is basically the checkout line at the grocery store. Well, this might have been the entrance, you know, people queuing up to get in. Oh, that sounds like a fun thing to wait for. Yeah, yeah. Well, she grabs her, but Ellie seems to be kind of a zombie now. 
The two go back up the stairs with the demon following all the way. And once upstairs, Ellie wakes up. All four of the family try to head outside to the car, but the door now opens to the door downstairs. There's no way There's out. There's no way out, yes. Bill, uh, uh, Brian, Ellie, and Stevie all start counting and walking away. This time, Kira joins them. Gotcha. Mm-hmm. Okay, well, it's pretty good. There's just one mystery after another, and the creepy factor is turned way up on this one. It's not exactly a haunted house. It's more like Amityville Horror, a demon-infested home. The acting was decent. The sets were well done. What we saw of the creature looked good. There was a bit of pseudo-scientific battle about Schrodinger by babble about Schrodinger's box and the mathematics of other dimensions that try to make things make sense. It doesn't. Oh, it kind of does. What does Schrodinger's box have to do with any of this? He was just using that as an example. Of something completely unrelated and irrelevant. Yeah, right. All right, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Because it sounds all metaphysical. And everybody's sh- heard of Schrodinger's box. The cat is alive, and the cat is dead, but it's neither, and it's both, and it's got nothing to do with a monster in your basement. Well, oh, your your basement is, <laughs> is both a portal to hell and just an ordinary basement, but you don't know until you open the door and look. I think he was kind of getting, you know, kind of implying that. Yeah, all right. It's both a portal all and not right. a portal at the same time. <laughs> All right. It's kind of an explanation, not an explanation at the same time. Kind of, yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, the simple explanation about why this all happened is that old Mr. Featherston released something while trying to save his ailing son by using math to solve and invoke magic. I guess that's a good enough reason, and it works well enough here. Although these people do make every stupid mistake they could possibly imagine. Mm-hmm. Starting with not fixing that door. Fix that door. <laughs> yeah, how many times you got to have one of your kids get terrorized in the basement with a locked door before you just, you know, do something about that lock? Uh-huh. Oh, well. It's all right. I liked it. I liked it, too, on the first at the, on the first viewing, but the more I thought about it, the worse it got in and my And then mind. you started getting angry about it. <laughs> <laughs> it's one of those, <laughs> <Okay>. yes. <laughs> All right, well, uh, stop back next week where we will have four more movies and a short for you. More movies, we all right. we got some good ones next week. We do. Um, a little doggone craziness, if I have to say so. Mm-hmm. Oh. Oh. Battle Dogs and Cujo. Ooh. we got a theme going. Yeah. A little well, bit. A little bit of a theme. we got bit. two of them going there. Mm-hmm. And a couple more films also. Be sure to sign up for the email newsletter that comes out once a week. Horrorbulletin.com will take you right there. Or, of course, you can read all our regular reviews on horrorguys.com. Uh, sign up for the uh, Horror Bulletin list there also. And while you're there, you can stop in and look at our books in both paperback and ebook format. Buy them all. There's a whole pile of books there and growing. All right. I'm Brian. And I'm Kevin. And we'll see you next week. See ya. <laughs> <laughs>